Good afternoon. My name is Jennifer Mason McAward. I'm director of the Klaus Center for Civil and Human Rights and an associate professor of law here at Notre Dame. On behalf of the Klaus Center and the Rooney Center for the Study of American Democracy, welcome and thank you for tuning in. I suspect that many of you, like myself, are still trying to process Wednesday's events. How do we comprehend the violence, the disdain for the democratic process, the desecration of our national capital? How did this happen and what comes next? While we can't offer any definitive answers, we can at least try to offer context to help each other think critically about this moment. Where does Wednesday fit in the political history of our nation? What does it say about our political parties? How does it compare to insurrections in other countries? What are the legal consequences of these actions? And what can we anticipate in the coming days? We have three of my distinguished faculty colleagues here today to help us think through these issues. Jimmy Garule, Professor of Law, Christina Walbrecht, Professor of Political Science and Director of the Rooney Center for the Study of American Democracy, and Scott Mainwaring, the Eugene P. and Helen Conley Professor of Political Science. Each panelist will begin with some opening comments. As they talk, we encourage you to submit questions via the chat function. After the opening comments, I'll pose as many of those questions as I can to our panelists for the remainder of our time together. And so let's begin. We'll start with Professor Garule. Jimmy, thanks for being here, and I'll turn it over to you. Sorry, I'm muted, excuse me. I'd like to take a couple of minutes to uh, address the question of accountability and specifically focusing on President Trump. And the precise issue is whether or not President Trump should be criminally investigated for the attack on the US Capitol building. In my opinion, he should. And specifically because uh, he formed and incited the mob that attacked the, the Capitol building. What's my factual basis for that? And then I wanna comment on uh, a couple of statutes that I think uh, are applicable to, uh, to President Trump and uh, should be considered in, uh, in the investigation. You know, first for over two months, President Trump has, has repeated on a daily basis, the big lie. And the big lie is that Trump won the election, the presidential election by a massive landslide and that the election uh, President-elect Biden was stolen and was procured by massive fraud. And he has repeated this lie again uh, on a daily basis, stoking the anger of his, uh, of his supporters. Second, uh, Trump incited the riot at the US Capitol building. Uh, prior to uh, January 2nd, he had tweeted, and I quote, big protest in DC on January 6th, be there, will be wild end quote. Third, on the day of the riot itself, Trump participated in a rally on the ellipse in front of the uh, White House. And there he urged his supporters to, quote, stop the steal, end quote, and prevent Democrats from, quote, fraudulently taking over our country, end quote. He urged them to show strength and to mar march to the Capitol, falsely claiming that he would be there with them. And I think that his, um, this language of, you know, show strength was really code words for, uh, for violence, you know, in, in eliciting, inciting violence. Uh, fourth, uh, Trump resisted requests to deploy the US, uh, the DC National Guard. And then fifth and finally, while the rioting was taking place, Trump did not condemn the violence. Instead, he told his followers, and I quote, go home, we love you, you're very special, end quote. These are the things and events, he went on to state, these are the things and events that happen when a sacred landslide election victory is so unceremoniously and viciously stripped away. These are Trump's words. And so I think that uh, the responsibility for inciting this violence rests 
squarely on the shoulders of President Trump. From a legal perspective, I think that there are three statutes that arguably could be charged uh, against President Trump and certainly should be investigated for their application. The first is the seditious conspiracy statute found at 18 USC 2384. And I'm gonna discuss these in order of severity. This particular statute carries a sentence of up to 20 years in prison. And it has three simple elements. Again, it's seditious conspiracy. So it's, a, it's conspiracy, it requires an agreement between two or more people. That's the first element. Uh, second, to use force. By the way, the statute doesn't say that it's limited to deadly force just to use force. And this is what's most important. And, and the language of the statute says to use deadly, to use force to quote, prevent, hinder, or delay the execution of any law of the United States. So did President Trump have the intent to prevent, hinder, or delay the execution of any law of the United States? And I maintain that he did. And the law that he intended to delay was the 12th Amendment. The 12th Amendment that provides the, the process and the procedures for counting electoral votes and certifying the President of the United States. His effort was to delay, to uh, impede uh, that process, that constitutional uh, authorized process. Uh, the statute also provides, again, another theory under the seditious conspiracy statute would be if the, the President had the intent to seize, take, or possess any property of the United States, contrary to the authority thereof. And at least with respect to his supporters that actually stormed the Capitol building, I think we could, we could argue that they had the intent to take possession of the Capitol building, to control it, to uh, again, take possession of, that, um, of the seat of, uh, of, our, of our democracy. Second, I think that President Trump could be investigated, should be investigated for violating another statute, which is the uh, insurrection statute found at 18 USC section 2383. This statute carries a penalty of 10 years in prison, but also part of the penalty is that if the defendant is found guilty, he is incapable of holding any office under the United States. So that would prevent the president from running for reelection in 2024. And here the, the elements are, are, are quite quite straightforward. There's, there's uh, simply, the, the statute simply provides, whoever incites, assists, or engages in any rebellion or insurrection against the authority of the United States or the laws thereof. So again, to incite, to assist, or to engage in any rebellion. So what we witnessed with respect to the attack on the Capitol building, did that constitute rebellion? Did that constitute insurrection? Insurrection is defined by Webster's Dictionary as an uprising against the government. Is that what Trump's supporters were doing, engaging in an uprising against the government? I think that, that at least it, it's an argument. I think that um, it could be argued that that's exactly uh, what they were, were attempting to do. <clears throat> and excuse me, and it also provides that uh, this statute extends to anyone who gives aid or comfort thereto. So did President Trump give aid or comfort to the rioters with respect to their attempt at, at, at insurrection or, or rebellion against the, the authority of the United States? And by the way, again, what's the authority of the United States that they were rebelling against? Again, I think it would be the authority to certify the next president of the United States, president-elect Joe Biden. And then finally, um, the last statute is the Anti-Riot Act, found at 18 USC 2101. It carries a penalty of not more than five years in prison. And it has uh, three elements. It provides that whoever travels in interstate or foreign commerce, or uses any facility of interstate or foreign commerce, including but not limited to a phone in this particular case, I think a cell phone would be applicable, with the intent to do one of four things. With the intent to incite a riot, number one. Number two, to organize, promote, or participate in a riot. Number three, to commit any act of violence 
in furtherance of a riot, or four, to aid and abet any person in inciting or participating uh, in a riot or any act of violence in furtherance of the riot. So here, I think clearly the, uh, the rioters travel in interstate commerce. I mean, most of them uh, traveled from outside the District of Columbia to come to Washington, D.C. to participate in, the, uh, in this uh, in act of insurrection. And I think others, perhaps even including the president himself, used a uh, facility of interstate or foreign commerce, a cell phone. And that cell phone was used by President Trump, uh, again, via Twitter to organize his supporters, to invite them to come to Washington, D.C. on January 6th to participate in this wild event, as he characterized it, again, in an attempt to delay the uh, election certification process. I think that with respect to the different theories of uh, under the Anti-Riot Act that are applicable, I think that it could be argued that President Trump had the intent to incite a riot and that his followers promoted, participated in the riot and certainly committed acts of violence in furtherance of the riot. We know now that um, five individuals have died as a result of these violent acts and that uh, dozens and dozens of uh, Capitol Police and other law enforcement officers were injured as a result of their violent conduct. And so again, I think a compelling argument can be made that President Trump and his followers are liable for violating the Anti-Riot anti Act. And then lastly, I would just close with the following point. And that is that if our democracy is truly a constitutional democracy based on the rule of law, then, then people who violate the rule of law must be held accountable. Otherwise, the, um, the foundation of our democracy will begin to crumble. And uh, I believe, as the framers believe, that no one is above the law, including the President of the United States. And it's not enough simply for the president to give a, a two minute, uh, participate in a two minute video as he did yesterday, uh, now condemning the actions that occurred at the, at the Capitol building. That's not enough. His conduct, in my opinion, amounts to criminal activity and he should be held accountable for the crimes that he committed, the incitement of, of violence and, uh, and rioting that, uh, that he's responsible for. So uh, I'll stop there. Thank you, Jen. Thank you, Jimmy. We really appreciate those really um, important insights and in providing that legal context for us. Uh, now I'd like to turn it over to Professor Christina Walbrecht, Professor of Political Science. Thanks, Jen. Uh, and thank you. It's been a pleasure to work with, uh, with you and Dory on putting together this uh, flash panel on this really sort of um, exceptional moment. Um, so I'm going to uh, bring a sort of different perspective um, as someone who studies and thinks a lot about political parties um, and um, uh, elections in the United States. And so I want to start really where Professor Garuli sort of ended, which is to emphasize what an exceptional um, exceptional moment that we experienced on uh, Wednesday, on January 6th, um, where we saw the breaching and the temporary occupation um, of the US Capitol in an attempt to disrupt um, an election. Um, there've been a lot of questions about what we should call uh, this behavior. Um, I appreciated uh, Jimmy's comments about sort of legal definitions of riots, et cetera. Um, at this point, I think probably the, the political science phrase insurrection may be the, the sort of best description, um, a violent um, uprising against an authority or a government, right, to, to basically disrupt the actions of the elected U.S. Congress in, in doing its duty under the 12th Amendment. There's been some talk about a coup. Um, I'm not going to get into that argument. I will say that uh, usually a coup um, involves um, the complicity or the behavior of some part of the US military. So there are still questions about uh, perhaps the delaying of bringing in the National Guard uh, that may sort of move us into coup territory. Uh, but right now we're sort of thinking about that as an insurrection. 
uh, I saw this morning President Emmanuel Macron of, of France um, has said, and I think correctly, that Wednesday's event should be understood as an assault not just on America and its democracy, but on democracies everywhere. As again, Professor Gurley just sort of said, if you let this sort of behavior stand, the disruption of, of democratic processes, um, you're really sort of undermining this, the stability of the system as a whole. The fact that it is unprecedented, however, does not mean that it cannot be understood, excuse me, <laughs> the fact that it is exceptional does not mean that it cannot be understood, and it doesn't mean that there aren't, there aren't historic, important historic precedents uh, for understanding the events um, uh, of Wednesday. So I want to start really basic, some thinking about sort of um, uh, social behavior and social psychology. Um, what we saw on Wednesday was sort of an extreme version of, of a, a set of behaviors that are really, frankly, endemic to human relations, and that's this sort of in-group and out-group identity, right? Um, we know that social cohesion is, is necessary for, for um, survival and it is probably evolutionarily um, uh, successful. Uh, we know uh, from psychologists that categorization uh, of the whole world, including uh, other people, is, is how we as human beings understand the world. And more importantly, it's how we understand our own place in the world. I'm, I'm gonna get to insurrection, I promise you. Um, we know that it's a basic human need um, for both inclusion to be part of something, but also differentiation. I am this, I am not that, right? Sort of fundamental um, human behavior. Group identity, the sense that I am these things and I belong in these groups of people um, is, is really how we um, psychologically attain those sorts of basic human needs for inclusion, for categorization, for sort of understanding where we sit in the world. What we know from multiple experiments and a, just a, an enormous pile of, of, of research is that any population, including strangers who have never met each other before, will seek to belong to a group and to, to distinguish themselves from out-group members. You can put a bunch of people who've never met each other before and say, you are the blue group and you are the red group. And within a very short period of time, the blue group people will tell you how morally you know, uh, suspect, uh, criminal and problematic group red members are, right? The, the, the out group is, is always uh, going to be. Um, and again, this, this very sense of group identity leads to all sorts of privileging of your in-group and all sorts of excluding of your out-group. Um, to quote uh, the political scientist Lillian Mason, who's written a really important book on this called Uncivil Agreement, the privileging of victory over the greater good is a natural outcome of even the most meaningless group label, right? You get this sense of shared fate. When my team wins, I win. When my team loses, I lose, right? It's not a lose for the team, who I'm rooting for, it is a loss for me specifically. That sort of group identity is gonna affect who we deem as trustworthy and authoritative, and it's gonna to lead to exaggerated perceptions of difference, right? It's not just that we're, you know, we have a little policy debates, we're trying to distinguish an error, oh, you live in that neighborhood, I live in this one, or you're Catholic, I'm Protestant, or uh, uh, racial differences, you imagine them, right? But rather a much more exaggerated uh, perception of difference. Uh, keeping up with this idea of an explainer, uh, that brings us to an idea you might be hearing about in the press, uh, uh, what political so social psychologists would call motivated reasoning. This is the idea that our brains naturally seek out evidence to support our own beliefs and identities. Things that are consistent with the way that we see the world, right? Our brain naturally discounts any evidence that we get that is in conflict with our own beliefs and identities. This doesn't mean we're incapable of rational decision-making or of updating our beliefs, but it means that our natural response is always to, you know, that tweet you saw that seems consistent with your beliefs, you absolutely think must be true. That information you see that is not consistent, you're going to discount. Let's get then to partisanship. Uh, partisanship is a major sort of source of group identity um, in the United States and, and, and frankly, um, all over the world. We know a lot about partisanship in the United States. We know it's developed in childhood. You might compare it to how we develop religious identity. The people around us 
share values. They have us engage in certain rituals, whether that be the ritual of attending mass or the ritual of participating in elections or putting yard signs uh, uh, in uh, to proclaim your political support, et cetera. Um, I'd be happy to talk about people who feel uncomfortable with that religious analogy, but uh, it, it certainly works in lots of important ways. Um, we know that like religion, partisan identities are very stable over the lifetime. Um, conversion is possible, uh, but is, is the exception rather than the rule. Um, another important, I think, comparison, and that it shapes our views of the rest of the world, as, as I was just saying. In the Federalist Papers, the, the framers, Hamilton in particular, talked about the sort of relationship between partisanship and the stability of American democracy. And what Hamilton wanted to argue was that actually the, the sort of large size of the United States, even at the time of the founding, um, was going to be was going to make it possible for democracy democracy to succeed, despite Hamilton wouldn't have understood them a little bit differently. But in, in what basically he was saying is, despite these sort of human preferences for in group and out group sort of behaviors, and what Hamilton said is, in such a large country, we're going to have he didn't use these terms cross cutting cleavages. What does that mean? It means that. I, I'm going to have lots of different group identities and that to the extent that they overlap, I'm never going to see other people as entirely the enemy, right? So I might, I might, uh, my, my labor union membership might lead me to favor certain outcomes and certain policies, but my Catholic identity might lead me to different sorts of conclusions. And while I might disagree with someone on the basis of, um, uh, uh, partisan identification, they may all, they may, however, still be my co-religionist. And so I, I can't really see them um, in, in such a negative light because we share other values, even if we disagree on particular identities. Throughout American history, one of the most consistent things we see is when identities align rather than cross cut, we see sharper partisanship and much more political violence. We are in a period like that today. Um, we have fewer of these cross cut, um, cutting alliances. We, um, uh, racial differences, re uh, religious differences in particular, Republicans um, as the party of, of uh, whites and of nationalism and of Christianity, Democrats seen as the party of secularism, of multiculturalism, of uh, 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 multi-racism, uh, minority religious and minority uh, racial groups. We're also divided in terms of class, geography, culture, um, et cetera. There are real consequences to that, right? Which is that uh, we see greater anger and activism when our, all of our identities sort of line up with our partisanship. It's not just that I lost or that my party lost, but that my religious tradition lost, that my racial group lost, um, et cetera, et cetera. This leads to things like negative partisanship in which it's more that we dislike the other party than we're so supportive of our, uh, of our own party. And of course, given what we know about motivated reasoning, it makes those sorts of uh, dynamics even more important. I'm gonna discount everything said by the other side because all of my in-group tendencies are on this side. There's no, there's no identity that I have that makes me sympathetic to this other political party. I wanna finally just sort of wrap up by talking a little bit about partisanship and violence. Um, I want to start with uh, uh, where all discussions of parties should start, which is with uh, the political scientist E. Schatzschneider, who famously said, political parties created democracy and modern democracy is unthinkable, save in terms of political parties, right? So uh, this gathering into teams to contest elections is a characteristic of every known democracy um, in the world. And so as we think about solutions, we need to think uh, within that sort of framework. What makes political parties parties is that they seek to control government through elections, the contesting of elections. What that means is that we have quite a spectrum, right? So there's one way to contest elections, right? That's what makes parties not interest groups. It makes them lots of other different things. They, they nominate candidates for election. On one end of that continuum is sort of the legal means by which we contest elections. Um, we back candidates, well, we nominate candidates. Partisans vote for those candidates. They support them in other ways, et cetera. But there's another end to that, uh, that uh, continuum, which is the engaging in violence to disrupt or damage 
the legal context of um, our elections. And, and here I want to quote my, my colleague, Nathan Kelmo, who's written really important stuff on partisan um, uh, uh, partisan violence. Um, he said just yesterday, our party identities are largely aligned by race and religion, similar to how they did in the second half of the 19th century, which not coincidentally was full of racial partisan violence. The most obvious historical parallels are before the Civil War, when there were dozens of violent attacks, uh, including guns drawn on members of Congress, for example. The Civil War itself can be understood as sort of the ultimate outcome um, of partisan violence. It was, as Nathan has said, actually an election disrupting event, right? That Lincoln was certified as president and uh, Southern Democrats protested that violently and that led to um, the Civil War. Jim Crow, the, the sort of um, violent often suppression of African-American votes in the South from the 1850s through until the 1960s can also be understood as a form of partisan violence in which one party, uh, Southern Democrats, forcibly and violently um, kept um, uh, African-Americans from participating in those free and fair elections. I think I've used up all my time, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop there. Thank you so much. Great, thank you so much for that. It's just a real, um, we're so fortunate to have people from different disciplines um, coming at this moment in history. So thank you for providing the political science perspective. Um, now on to Professor Mainwaring. Thank you, Jen. Um, I am a comparative political scientist. I study authoritarianism and democracy around the world. So I'm not a US expert. My comments will proceed from my many decades of studying democracy and authoritarianism around the world. I want to begin with um, maybe three comments, two or three comments about the mob, uh, and then a few comments about the president and close with a couple comments about uh, American democracy and what Wednesday's events might suggest about it. So, the three comments about the mob. First, I mean, I think probably almost everyone viewing this um, agrees. This was just an amazing incident, uh, amazing and appalling. Um, the US Capitol is probably the most important shrine to democracy in the world. It's venerated not only in our country, but around the world as a hugely important pillar of democracy. So it was just shocking, dismaying to see this, this enormously venerated shrine violated in that fashion. Second, I wanna take up something that Christina alluded to, was this a coup? I've seen some people saying that this was a coup attempt um, by the mob. Um, and maybe this is, maybe, maybe I'm going down into the weeds too much about how political scientists think, or at least how I think about this. I would say no. I think a coup attempt is an attempt to overthrow a government. This was an attempt to overthrow election results, but I don't really think it was an attempt to overthrow a government. After all, the sitting government in the US is the Trump government and clearly these, the, the, this mob was not trying to overthrow the Trump government. Um, all right, uh, a few comments about President Trump. Um, four comments about his role in these events. First, I mean, I think that, you know, it's clear that he was, or, in 2006 and Mexico in 2012, when the losing candidate, who is now the president, engaged in very, very vigorous demonstrations with mass um, demonstrations against the election results. Um, Mexico had very solid election institutions. Um, so I, you know, I'm pretty convinced that these elections were free and fair. The main point, though, is that this is by in international by international comparisons, it is pretty unusual 
that a sitting and even more that a sitting president would try to disrupt free uh, the results of an election after it happened. Um, okay, second, um, political scientists, comparative political scientists have a concept of self-coup, um, which means that the president or the executive, a prime minister, tries to overthrow the, the, the democracy. Um, some of the important examples in history include Peru in 1992, Uruguay in 1973, and some, there's some discussion that President Trump engaged in a, an auto golpe, a self coup. Here again, I, I think that this is an exaggerated description. He wasn't trying, he was trying to overthrow the results of a democratic election, but I think it's maybe not quite the case that he was trying to overthrow a democracy, right? Uh, might, that might seem like a thin distinction, but the two self coups that I previously mentioned were actually the president uh, shut down Congress and shut down the courts. So these were very, they were very abrupt, complete dis disruptions of democracy. Um, and then the last two things I wanted to mention about um, Trump's actions this week are two other plausible ways that we could view his actions this week and since the elections in November. One, which is more extreme, and I'm a little bit skeptical of it myself, but some excellent political scientists have argued that, um, that we needed to worry about the breakdown of democracy under Trump, that he represented something very akin to heads of government such as Vladimir Putin in Russia, Erdogan in Turkey, um, Viktor Orban in Hungary. These are executives who have presided over democratic breakdowns. In fact, the most common form of democratic breakdown since the end of the Cold War is not a coup by external actors, but rather executive takeovers of democracy. Um, I think, you know, I think that Trump, by trying to overthrow an election, um, if he had succeeded, then we might say, yes, there, you know, th this does constitute um, an executive coup. Um, but as it is, I think it's more. Um, of, of a failed attempt to take over democracy. Um, and so finally, how would I view, how would I characterize President Trump's actions during this period and during his term? I would say it was a very aggressive attempt to weaken democratic checks and balances, to undermine uh, opposition rights, to um, attack opposition, to um, install loyalists throughout um, branches of government, throughout government agencies, which should be independent of the executive, but in Trump's view, should have been, you know, should, should be agencies staffed by loyalists to him. Now this, to, 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 to most viewers of democracy, this is dangerous. And if it goes really, really far, it can eventually tilt into executive takeovers of democracy. There's no question about that. But if we compare how far Trump went down the road of an executive takeover to Viktor Orban or Putin or Hugo Chavez and his successor, Nicolas Maduro in Venezuela, um, Trump was not very successful. He did not go very far down that path. Did he have the ambition? Did he have a, a personality style, personal preferences, similar to many of those other leaders? I would say yes to that question. But our institutions generally, they, they mostly held, and we saw this in this period between um, the first um, Tuesday in November, and uh, Wednesday of this week. Um, 
the, the assault on democratic norms, I think, under the Trump administration was very profound and it would have continued probably in a second Trump term. But I think that um, my own view is that you know, this, this was that, that our institutions did hold relatively well. Um, let me just close with a couple of comments about US democracy. The first is that, um, you know, we built probably the first mass male democracy in the world, and we have many, many things about which to be proud of our democratic history. But we have a lot of very important democratic shortcomings today. Uh, the, the extreme polarization that Christina mentioned is certainly one of them. If you look at the two most important um, democracy measures in the world, Freedom House and Varieties of Democracy, they do not place US democracy among the most vibrant in the world by a long shot. Freedom House lists about 50 countries in the world as having more solid democracies than we do in the United States today. I'm not convinced that that judgment is absolutely spot on, but I am absolutely convinced that we do have very important democratic problems today that have to be addressed. The second comment, um, I don't wanna be poly, Pollyannish here, but I think that the um, Wednesday's events I believe could prove beneficial in, in not in a huge way, but in, in some modest way to our democracy. Specifically, I think we see the, a, a modest peeling off of some parts of the Republican party from Trump. And uh, in my view, which some of you will not agree with, but um, in my view, Trump represented the, 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 a more authoritarian project within the Republican Party. And I think it's very healthy for American democracy to have some, some of the Republican Party peeling off from the Trump wing. Uh, before Wednesday, I would have judged that Trump would probably have been almost unbeatable if he had run for the Republican nomination in 2024. And I think that has changed. I'm not saying that he couldn't win now, but I think that his chances of retaining the fierce hold that he's had over the last four or five years over the party, I think that that has changed somewhat. I'll close there, thank you. All right, thanks Professor Mainwaring and thanks to each of you um, on the panel and thanks to all of you who have submitted um, questions through the Q&A feature, you're welcome to continue doing so. Um, in the remainder of our time, I just wanna submit um, some questions that have come through um, and, and get your thoughts on them. Um, so Professor Wolbrecht, I'll start with you. To go back to and to draw an analogy to your in-group, out-group framing, um, we've seen the ubiquitous picture of the man in the Viking outfit. And it sends a message, I think, that those who invaded the Capitol might've been a little bit crazy um, and certainly we're not like most Americans. And so for those of us watching on TV, the insurrectionists were the out group, but a closer look at that group might reveal that there were many who could easily have been our neighbors. And indeed some were elected representatives, the mayor of an Oklahoma town, a West Virginia legislature. How do we understand who these people are? And does it matter how we characterize them? Are they activists, protesters, partisans, extremists, white nationalists? How do we think about the group that was at the Capitol on Wednesday? So this is a the great question, especially because uh, it allows me to make a couple of points I didn't have, um, have time for. Um, uh, when we were putting this panel together, one of the things I said is that I didn't want to call them extremists, uh, in part because it's not clear exactly how extreme um, they are. Uh, and so some of the early surveys uh, coming out uh, indicate a great deal of support uh, am among Republic people who identify as Republicans uh, for, uh, for what happened on Wednesday, or at least for sort of pushing the, the end to that. Um, very high percentages of Republicans report that they, uh, that they do think that something went wrong in the, in the November election, that votes were thrown out, that votes were, uh, that there was, you know, uh, some sort of illegal or inappropriate 
activity that stole the election from Donald Trump. Um, and so in that sense, one of the things that is, we, we can maybe, maybe um, lots of people didn't wear fur, uh, fur Vikings, uh, you know, breaking into the Capitol, um, but lots of people support the behavior of those who did, right? And so um, whatever happens in the, new the next two weeks, those sorts of attitudes that, that violence may be the answer, that it may be appropriate, uh, to sort of reach out. So uh, I'm looking, uh, for example, um, and I recommend a, a group called Brightline Watch, which is a group of political scientists who have been trying to think about uh, the very sorts of challenges to democracy that Professor Mainwaring was talked about. Um, in October, they found that 15% um, of respondents said it would be at least occasionally okay for their own party to use violence. If their party lost, about 25% of them said it might be okay to use um, uh, violence. And if the other party got violent first, that number raises to about 40%. Um, so I, I think those attitudes are real. Um, and, and, and certainly it's not as if we don't have a long tradition of uh, violence in American politics um, in all sorts of different ways going from, uh, and, and here I would, uh, I would include sort of the violence against George Floyd that led to the Black Lives Matter uh, 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 movement uh, this summer. Um, to Jim Crow, to all sorts of things. I do wanna make one important distinction though. And, um, and, and one definition I wasn't able to come up with today was this idea of asymmetric polarization. So we're certainly in a really polarized period in which the two parties seem very far apart. Um, political scientists, however, for the last couple of years have been increasingly showing that that polarization is not driven equally by the two parties. We tend to see them as equal but rather that a lot of that polarization has been driven on the right by the Republican party and, and less so on the left, the Democratic party. That does not mean that Democrats are not are, are without blame um, or have not contributed to sort of some of these things. But that, I think the real problem now isn't that the parties are so far apart and that this leads to these sort of you know normal group uh, contention, but rather that one party is, is advocating for, many people in it are advocating for sort of assaults on democracy, right? Uh, assaults on the free press, uh, on the idea of, uh, of sort of facts, assaults on uh, our uh, educational institutions, um, uh, assaults on voting rights uh, and you know removal of uh, voting places, et cetera. Uh, and I say that because as a professor of political science who prides themselves on, on wanting to, you know, we're not here to, to be partisan, but we are here, I think, with a certain uh, commitment to democratic values. And I do think there's reasons to think those are under assault. Just follow up on that question of equivalence. Um, many commentators in the last few days, including President-elect Biden and Michelle Obama, have contrasted the confrontational and often violent police response to the Black Lives Matter protesters this summer with the seemingly passive initial response of the Capitol Police on Wednesday. Can you help us think through that comparison and why there might have been such a difference in the police response to these different types of protests? Um, I think the in-group, out-group form uh, continues or, or code of conception continues to be useful here. Um, when you have one group, and you presume these bad things by your outgroup, a perception of an expectation of violence, of lawlessness, et cetera. Uh, and there's no question that the United States has long been characterized by um, various forms of white supremacy um, and, a, and a hierarchy that assumes that um, one group is lawful, one group is, uh, and, and what it does is lawful. So the things that it does almost by definition cannot be illegal, um, and one group that is sort of naturally unlawful and, uh, and disordered um, in important ways. Um, and I think that we see some of the repercussions of this, and I would love to hear, um, uh, especially from Professor Gruley in, in particular, um, in you know what the early reports were getting from the Capitol Police is, we didn't think that, we knew that this protest was happening, we assumed it wouldn't be violent, we assumed that it would be X and Y. Uh, and so part of, of course, the reason that the Capitol was breached was that there was not sufficient um, support, police support, uh, security forces um, to keep that from happening. Um, and, and I do think it's important to ask why, what were the assumptions in that? And why did we see such m much stronger security force 
engagement with, again, as you just suggested, Black Lives Matters um, and other movements. We had people, you know, handicapped people arrested and, and pulled out of uh, the Capitol for protesting health care, for example, and uh, yet arrests seem to be slow in coming uh, on Wednesday. I, let, let, me re, let me respond. I, I think, and, and I hope I'm not being too too extreme here, but I think it, I think what we witnessed last summer with respect to the police response to the, the Black Lives Matter protesters and then what we witnessed on Wednesday of this week uh, raises some questions about whether our law enforcement, there are white supremacists embedded in our law enforcement agencies. At least it's a question, I think it's a fair question and it's a question that needs to be examined and investigated. I, I understand this, this question or this concern raised or justification raised by the Capitol Police. We, we didn't expect this and, and it was much larger and more violent than we anticipated and we weren't prepared for it. But that does not explain why we have Capitol Police officers that are taking selfies with these insurgents. When we have police officers who are taking selfies with these insurgents, when they're helping the insurgents down the steps of the Capitol building, when they're holding the door open for the insurgents that have desecrated our Capitol building, I think the, the implication there is that those police officers are aligned with the, with the people that they're, they're supposed to be uh, enforcing the law against, that they believe in their cause. They're one and the same. They're sympathetic to that cause. And therefore, they're engaged, not simply in we weren't prepared, but, but a dereliction of duty. They're actually violating their responsibility to enforce the law against the lawbreakers because they're sympathetic to the cause of the rioters and, and the lawbreakers. And I think on the flip side, we're seeing that with respect to the very hostile, aggressive, violent action that's taken by police officers against African-Americans and the Black Lives uh, uh, Matter movement uh, as well. They're, they're hostile uh, to that group. And therefore, they think that they're justified in using excessive force and violence against those protesters, but not against the white uh, protesters, rioters that uh, engage in this assault on our Capitol on Wednesday. I, Professor Gruley does not need my support, but I, I do want to point out to those watching that Professor Gruley served in our Department of Justice under President George H, uh, excuse me, George W. Bush. Um, so uh, this is someone who speaks with some authority uh, about uh, these these sorts of matters. Um, so Professor Gruley, to just um, continue talking to you for a minute, you've you've talked us through some of the possible charges um, that might be brought against President Trump. Um, and yesterday, in short order, we had reports that the Justice Department was in fact considering charges, um, but also reports that the president has explored the possibility of pardoning himself. Can you talk us through um, this idea of a self-pardon? Um, if it were to happen, would there be any kind of review of that decision? It's, it's never been done before. So help us think about the permissibility and propriety and review of a possible decision on the part of Trump to pardon himself. Well, it raises a very, a very interesting issue because as you stated, Jen, we're, we're, this, is, this would be unprecedented. We've never had a situation in the history of our country where a president has sought to or, or pardon himself. And so there, there's no precedent, there's no legal authority that we can turn to, that we can cite to guide us on, uh, on whether this is uh, um, an exercise of the president's lawful constitutional powers under, uh, under Article II or whether it's an abuse of power. And, uh, and so we'll see, uh, but, but I think a couple of things, I think if we go back and, and we look at the, at, at the framers of, of the constitution, it's pretty clear, I think, that, that, that they believed that a person should not be the judge of himself, of, you know, of, of his own criminal conduct. There are some, some statements to, to, to that effect in the, in the history of, of our constitution. And, and so, uh, and I do believe that they believed that, uh, that, that no one is above the law. And, and so a president pardoning himself, I think would violate both of those fundamental principles that I think were held dear 
by our by our founding fathers. Uh, so, so that provides us some guidance and maybe some argument against that proposition. But again, I don't know that it's that it's compelling enough to to overturn it. Now, if if there was a chalice, let's assume that President Trump does that on the way out before January twentieth, he pardons himself. Then what's likely to happen? You know, would there be a challenge uh, before the Supreme Court? Who would who would raise that challenge? You know, who would have standing to to, to raise that? Who, who would be injured as, as a result of that and therefore have standing to raise that issue? I mean, it becomes very, very complex in that regard. And then would the uh, would the court, based on that issue, as well as some others, be willing to undertake that um, that examination? And so um, I hope we don't go there. I hope we don't get there. But I think that there's probably a very high likelihood that we'll we'll see that happen. Thank you. Professor Mainwaring, on Wednesday, we heard the phrase banana republic a lot on TV. And I'm hoping that you can help us understand what that refers to um, and then help us think about what we can learn from the experience of other countries who have had insurrections against a democratically elected government um, and, and think about what can we do, especially in the next 12 days to ensure um, the continued um, strength and viability of our democratically elected government? Well, of course, the notion of banana republic has always been, it's been a very derogatory term. I think it was probably initially coined with respect to Honduras and or Guatemala, both of which produced huge numbers of export bananas beginning in the early 20th century, if not before, their governments were laughably corrupt. Um, so that's, that's the origin of the term. Um, what, what should the next, I mean, I, I, don't, I'm not, I don't really have a good answer to your question about the next 12 days, right? Um, should the president be removed from office through the 25th Amendment. I think it's, it seems that that's very unlikely. Should he be impeached? Uh, I think that's also pretty unlikely. And moreover, if, if that were to take place, it would the impeachment proceedings would consume a lot of energy in Congress during the early parts of the Biden administration. President-elect Biden might prefer to spend his political capital on other issues. I, I don't know, but he, he might just think, no, that's, that's so divisive and so time consuming. The, the question that um, you know, I might say a bit more about is what are some of the steps toward rebuilding democracy in the US? Um, I think, you know, one of the, the important things that I took heart from this week was uh, some members of Congress, uh, for example, Senator Ben Sasse of Nebraska, saying, we have to tell the truth, right? Um, I think that is a responsibility of members of Congress. We, we keep, one of the ways to reduce polarization is to reduce lies. Too much of our country is living in a world free of facts, reality, science. Um, uh, Senator, Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan, who of course is long deceased, once famously said, you are entitled to your own opinions, but you aren't entitled to your own facts. That should be a saying that every Democrat, and I don't mean in the partisan sense, I mean someone who is an advocate of democracy should believe in that same. Thank you. That seems like, I'm not sure whether that's going to be a, a long-term thing for us to kind of get back to the truth or a short-term thing. Um, but our time together is almost over. And I just wanted to ask each of you to just spend maybe one minute um, telling us what are you going to be looking for in the next few weeks? Um, what are the key things that you expect to see happen or you're going to look to 
to see whether um, this insurrection is gaining momentum, um, whether it's a one-time thing. What should we be looking for as consumers of the news? Well, let me, let me just uh, comment. I don't know if this is directly uh, in, in response to your question, but, but I'm, I'm hoping that, that as a country over not only the next uh, uh, couple of weeks, but, uh, but the next several months and perhaps even beyond, begin doing some serious soul searching as, as a country and whether or not we, we are truly a democracy. Because what I witnessed on Wednesday was a significant segment of our population that apparently doesn't believe in some of the fundamental pillars of our democracy. And one of those pillars is the peaceful transfer of power. And that was assaulted uh, at the time that our nation's capital was assaulted. And then it also, over the last two months, it appears that there's a significant segment of our population that doesn't believe in the uh, one of the, the tripartite branches of our government, and that's a judiciary. We have had 60 plus judicial opinions, and each of them have found that these claims of, of a fraudulent election could, were not supported by the facts. And yet, this, this, these Trump supporters have dismissed those judicial opinions and claimed that the judges, including Supreme Court justices, are corrupt, that they're members of some deep state, and therefore do not respect that institution of our democracy. And Christina pointed to, uh, alluded to another uh, important institution of our democracy, and that's the free press. And we know that there's a significant segment of our population that believes that the press is a corrupt. And, and, and anything that is reported in the press that, that is critical of the president is fake news. And therefore, they don't believe in, in the press. And so with respect to those individuals, I, I think there's some serious soul searching about whether or not they believe in a democracy, believe in our democracy or not. Uh, I, I'll say that um, uh, political scientists have been very humbled in the last few years, so I'm, I'm, I'm not going to be uh, very predictive about what's going to happen. Uh, I would say um, I will be very interested to see about plans for the inauguration. It was already going to be um, uh, much smaller in lots of ways, um, but I assume and I hope uh, that lessons will be learned from Wednesday uh, about the security of, of that event. Um, it is in some sense a miracle that no member of Congress um, was killed. It is of course a tragedy that anyone died um, on Wednesday. Uh, but I think we have good reason uh, to be very worried about the safety of our elected officials. And I think that is again, uh, an attack on all of us. These were people that, that were chosen uh, uh, to represent us in government. And, and so that's dangerous. Um, I think the, the thing I'll be looking for in the more medium term really comes back to some of the things that both Scott and, and Jimmy have said, which is, uh, I wanna see how the Republican party responds to these events. So um, it's true that increasing numbers of Republicans have been critical. Um, it's also true that reports are that when Trump met with members of the Republican National Committee the next day, he was greeted with cheers. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so political parties really play, they've always been, they've long been recognized by the courts as, as really a, a quasi official role of sort of um, aggregating and, and uh, controlling sort of ambition and um, political conflict in the United States. And if one party refuses to play by the rules, um, that, that's incredibly damaging to the system as a whole. And so um, I, as someone who cares about, again, democracy small d, um, one hopes to see more Mitt Romney's uh, sort of going forward. Well, I endorse everything that Jimmy and Christina have just said. I guess, you know, the things that I will be looking to, I, I completely agree with Christina. What, what will be shaping up in the Republican Party, right? Um, will the Ben Sasse's and Mitt Romney's, will the, the space for that faction of the party expand? It diminished hugely in the last several years. I think for our democracy, I, I take it to be really quite important that the democratic faction of the Republican party be stronger. To look at one other institution, I would say Congress, right? I mean, Congress, our Congress has been a mess 
in recent years. Uh, it's, it's become worse and worse over the last quarter century. Uh, and here, what I would look to is, do we, does partisanship trump everything in Congress or will the new president and the new Congress working with him be able to carve out some more spaces of negotiation, dialogue, compromise. Democracy is a system in which nobody gets everything they want. It's a system built on compromise and negotiation. And that's what is broken down with hyperpolarization. Um, so, um, you know, Joe Biden has expressed confidence that he can uh, help break this system or at least attenuate how bad it's gotten. I hope he's right. Well, we certainly all do. And our time is drawing to a close. And I just want to thank our panelists for your time and your expertise and wisdom that you've shared with us.